So we're live and recording. Okay, so we'll be starting in just a few minutes with our presentation from Dr. Monica Webb Hooper this morning. Uh, welcome and just sit tight for a couple minutes. For those of you just joining, we're gonna give it about two more minutes for last minute people to get in on the attendees before we get started with Dr. Weber's presentation. Good morning, everyone. Okay, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the first lecture of our spring 2021 Coffin Logan Center for Addiction Research and Treatment seminar series. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's part of our CLC family to the seminar today and also extend a special welcome to our friends of the center who are joining us from other departments at KU as well as other universities or organizations um, around the country. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'm going to explain a little bit about how the webinar will work this morning. Uh, Dr. Webb Hooper will be presenting slides on her screen. Uh, she will have video and voice at all times, and a selection of attendees will have the option of turning on their video feeds, uh, while others will not have video, and this is just to kind of minimize um, overload and distraction for Dr. Webb Hooper. Uh, we ask that everyone at all times mute your microphones unless you've been uh, selected to ask a question at the end. At the end of the talk, we do expect to have some time for questions, and it will be moderated. Uh, so if you have questions throughout the talk or at the end, you can send them as a direct message to me in the chat um, at the bottom of the Zoom window, and we will kind of curate the questions. And if your question is one of the ones that's selected, we'll call out your name and unmute your microphone for you so you can ask your question to Dr. Webb Hooper. Uh, but unfortunately, we probably won't have time to get to all of the questions today um, in that we want to keep this pretty much to an hour. Um, I want to acknowledge Sergey and Drew for their coordination and logistical support this morning. Um, and with the rest of the seminar series. And please be sure to check out our Twitter feed and our CLC events webpage for information on future speakers this semester, as well as brown bags. And I promise you will not be disappointed by the rest of the um, series. 
but we're very excited to start the series on a very high note this year. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker in our seminar series. We're fortunate to have Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, who's the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at NIH. So in this role, Dr. Webb Hooper works with the director and other leadership to drive the nation's health research efforts in minority health, and also to help define actionable interventions to improve the well-being of all underserved populations across this country. Uh, she's a clinical health psychologist and a translational behavioral psychologist, and she is considered an internationally recognized expert on tobacco use and community-informed interventions. Uh, she's exceptionally well-funded and le has led an impressive program of community-engaged research focusing on understanding mechanisms of tobacco use, stress, and the development of community and culturally informed interventions. Uh, all of her training actually is, seems to be from the state of Florida, um, which is a much sunnier place than we're in right now. Uh, she received her doctorate from the, in clinical psychology from the University of South Florida, a clinical internship at the University of Florida Health Sciences Center, and was prior to going to NIH was a professor of oncology, family medicine, community health and psychological sciences at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Um, at Case, she was also the inaugural director of the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center Office for Cancer Disparities Research. So this is truly a special opportunity for us to hear from a national leader at NIH um, on the topics of minority health and health disparities. And we're especially excited because she comes with the same focus we have on understanding addictive disorders. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Her talk is Community Responsive Interventions for Addictive Behaviors, Smoking Cessation as a Use Case. Welcome, Dr. Weber. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that really kind introduction. And I am just delighted to be here. Um, and I want to thank you for the invitation and the seminar series organizers. Um, I do hope that everyone is managing and coping with the times that we're living in and continuing to do everything possible to keep yourselves and your families healthy and safe. Um, you know, the impacts of COVID-19 are many and they do include physical, mental, and behavioral health effects. Mental health and the use of addictive substances are impacted negatively by the pandemic. And the importance of making sure that interventions and resource delivery are community responsive is really critical. So I won't be talking about NIH initiatives today because I've done lots of work, as you know, in addictions and in tobacco use. So I'd like to share with you our research group's work to develop community responsive smoking cessation interventions, which I think presents a use case potentially for other addictive behaviors and for other public health promotion efforts. So this is a journey that I'd like to take you on to really talk about how we develop and disseminate uh, culturally and community responsive interventions. This work uh, of building towards health equity is not easy and it's not fast. We can get there, but we have to stay focused on it. And these are seven steps that our group has undertaken um, to um, over the past more than a decade. So all these will kind of work through the various ways in which our group has addressed this, this list. And as you can see, it starts with problem identification and it ends with dissemination. So as we start, I'll offer a key definition. A health disparity is not just any health difference, but it's a particular type of health difference. And specifically, it's rooted in disadvantage at multiple levels, such as social, economic, and or you know, environmental. And the population to experience health disparities are those who have faced systematically greater obstacles to optimal health and we can characterize these populations in a number of ways, including by race or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, and others. These are groups that have often been discriminated against or excluded. And now here, here's an important point. Health disparities are modifiable differences. These are differences that do not have to exist. And that gives us an opportunity for change. And we know that tobacco smoking has wide ranging association with all cause mortality and chronic illnesses, and it leads to a disproportionate burden among racial and ethnic minoritized groups, and especially African American adults for the conditions indicated here and several others. And these are disparities that are long standing, very well documented, and unfortunately, there has not been 
measurable progress. So we need to do more. So we know currently that the prevalence of any tobacco use, actually it may, we'll see what happens in more recent reports now with COVID. This of course was before COVID when this survey was conducted. And the patterns though are consistent with what we've seen for a long time. And that is the, that the prevalence is greatest among American Indian, Alaska Native adults, and also among individuals who are in this identified other racial category, which largely includes individuals of multiple heritages. And there's not a disparity in smoking prevalence when you compare white and African-American adults. In fact, this is actually an example of a disparity that was eliminated in around 2001. So about 20 years ago this year. Not shown here is the higher prevalence of smoking menthol brands among African-American adults, which about 80 to 90% smoke menthol brands compared to about 30% of white adults. And evidence suggests that menthol brands are harder to quit. So those data were about current tobacco use, but what about disparities in quitting? So with regard to tobacco cessation, the most persistent disparity is that African-American males and females are less likely to achieve smoking cessation compared to their white male and female counterparts. This is a consistent finding across both epidemiological surveys and also clinical trials. So this remains a critical problem to address. And I must emphasize that this difficulty quitting smoking among African-Americans is not due to individual failures. In fact, multi-level factors contribute to this difficulty achieving this goal. And we've shown in our work that distress levels are often greater among African-American adults who wish to, who smoke and wish to quit. And one example is the stress associated with racial discrimination, which is positively related to smoking status. In addition, access is another problem. Access to evidence-based interventions is limited. And when treatment is offered, its cultural and community competence is often questionable. So these are some of the problems and some of the needs. So the next step was conducting formative research, which involved understanding the distinct needs, preferences, facilitators, and barriers to behavior change within the target population, which in this use cases, African-American adults who smoke, and having evidence for what information components might be beneficial um, and make a difference and how best to frame the content is important, especially from an equity perspective. And we uh, accomplished this early on by uh, testing sort of potential intervention components using qualitative research and experimental designs to understand key antecedents of behavior change in our target population. Okay, quick primer on types of interventions and terminology. So we're on the same page. There are several types of behavior change interventions used to treat tobacco dependence and other behaviors and addictions. So standard interventions are the one size fits all approaches that are designed in this case in the United States with the majority population in mind. Tailored interventions are designed to address unique individual characteristics. So for one person, and targeted interventions are those designed for a specific subpopulation, such as youth or women or a racial or ethnic group. Culturally specific interventions are a type of intervention targeting. These interventions have been described using a range of terms. I prefer the term culturally specific because I think it recognizes that while the intervention is designed for a particular population, it may not be a fit for all members of that group due to within group heterogeneity. And we know that qualitative methods can be highly informative and facilitate the generation of hypotheses and lead to learning about the facilitators and the challenges that might be unique or elevated within populations and subgroups. We also might use um, qualitative methods to examine preferred intervention formats and even discuss translation potential. So one of the themes that emerged in a qualitative study of African-American adults who smoke was around expectancies for this idea of culturally specific interventions and key intervention factors. So that is, what do the end users think about this intervention approach? We might as investigators see it as important, but before developing an intervention, gaining insight from members of the target group is essential. So the first quote here was representative of individuals with positive expectancies 
for culturally specific interventions and the potential importance of paying attention to the needs, issues, and the lived experiences of many African-American adults. The second participant, um, if you're reading it, expressed skepticism around this idea, rooted, as you can see, in the fear about potential racial discrimination and different treatment, but in a negative way. And this kind of, this individual specified, however, toward the end here, I think I've bolded it, that if the intervention addressed social conditions, then that would be acceptable. So these two quotes were highly informative, and there are many others in this study, and they provided a glimpse of the complexity of designing interventions for a specific population. So we also conducted, as part of our formative stage work, analog research among African-American adults to evaluate whether culturally specific message framing and content play causal roles in these antecedents to behavior change. So things like risk perception and cognitive factors like readiness to quit that are associated with tobacco smoking. So this study was a two by two factorial design and it tested the effects of content. So smoking messages or control messages about exercise and also culturally specific versus standard message framing. And as you can see here, compared to standard one size fits all messages, culturally specific framing produced significantly greater personal smoking risk perception. So I think I might be at risk of health problems if I continue to smoke. And the difference in um, smoking message content versus content about our control exercise um, information was, was not significant. We also tested the effects of message content, message framing, and their interaction on culturally specific risk perception. So I think that as a member of this, of this community, of African-American community in this case, that I might be at greater risk because of the social conditions. And these results were all stati statistically significant. So culturally specific risk perceptions, um, asking about items and health risks faced among African-Americans on average, what we found was that the perception of who received smoking, um, the perceptions of the, I'm sorry, participants who received the smoking message content had greater culturally specific risk perceptions compared to those who received exercise-based messages. There was also a significant effect of framing on culturally specific risk perception. So here, participants who received culturally specific messages had greater culturally specific risk perceptions compared to those who received the standard messages. And then we also found there's an interaction here such that participants in the culturally specific smoking messages condition also had the greatest culturally specific smoking risk perceptions. And that was in comparison to the other three conditions in this study. I'll show you one more finding from this study. This was about the sort of cognitive predict predictors um, of future cessation that we know have been found in the general population. Readiness to quit smoking is a predictor, intentions to quit. But it turns out that these are sort of less predictive among African-American adults who wish to quit. We found here that message content, specifically the smoking messages were more efficacious in producing greater readiness to quit smoking compared to the control messages. It's what you'd hope to see. And you see that in the figure on the left. But it was message framing and that culturally specific message framing in particular that led to greater intentions to quit smoking and that's illustrated in the figure on the right. So I think a main conclusion from this sort of formative study was that culturally specific message framing and content both play causal roles in these antecedents of behavior change. And this was one of the first studies to show in an experimental design that in comparison to standard or general approaches, culturally specific framing can lead to greater smoking related risk perceptions and also intentions to quit smoking. So next we consider the application of theoretical models of behavior change into this work, particularly models that included cultural and, and ethnic related components. So the Resnikal model, which you might be familiar with of cultural sensitivity and also the Cruder model of culturally tailored health communications, and I'm sure you're familiar with, were influential in the development of, of our interventions. And we were careful to incorporate surface structure components to enhance message acceptability and intervention acceptability, and also deep structure within the content to increase message salience. 
And we also applied strategies from Matt Kruder's model, what he wrote about, such as linguistics or um, you know, the ling linguistic components, um, constituent involving social, sociocultural and evidential, all incorporated into these interventions. Okay, so now we were prepared to develop uh, the intervention content and then conduct a pilot test. So we developed a culturally specific group cognitive behavioral therapy for smoking cessation, which was an adaptation of a very well-established cognitive behavioral program delivered in a standard form. So this is an example of what the culturally specific intervention consisted of. So the culturally specific framing and content were developed based on the previous work that we described and, and maybe a few other studies in advance of this. And the culturally specific group CBT importantly retained the content of the standard CBT, but it adapted it in such a way that it considered factors such as racial discrimination that we know affect tobacco use among African-Americans. So as an example, we covered stress and smoking during session three in both of these interventions, but in the, in the culturally specific CBT, the discussion has a different look and feel. And then we pilot tested this group-based intervention in a small sample looking for feasibility and acceptability, which we found to be very strong. And you know that the documentation, as we discussed early, of the existence of health disparities in smoking cessation is an important first step. And among my goals is to advance the science, both in my previous roles and now in my current role at NIH, to develop, test, and disseminate interventions to address modifiable behaviors that affect health and that have the potential to reduce or eliminate health disparities. So this, in my view, is one of the gaps in minority health and health disparity science. And with that, our next step was to conduct a randomized controlled trial. And the primary question was whether culturally specific CBT would demonstrate efficacy compared to standard. And this can be difficult um, to do this kind of head-to-head -head test, but it's important. So we randomized participants to receive eight sessions of either intervention, which occurred over four weeks and also provided eight weeks of nicotine patches. And we then followed participants for 12 months post behavioral therapy. And this figure summarizes the main findings from this head to head test. And what you see is that the culturally specific adaptation of CBT produced a significant longitudinal effect on biochemically verified abstinence through our 12 month post behavioral therapy period. So this was really positive. However, you know, I have a deep appreciation for the large effects that we can produce with intensive therapies. My experience in public health recognizes the need to ensure that such evidence-based interventions that do have the potential to make a significant impact on minority health and health disparities reaches as many people as possible. So strategies to accomplish this include internet-based interventions, telephone counseling, and mobile applications. Now, I have to tell you, I was hesitant initially about digital interventions in the population served by my group because we witness daily the digital divide and inequalities. Yes, they do still exist. And I think COVID has really shown that more than I think people believe at the time we were doing this work. And, you know, we can also even think about this digital divide as sort of the new redlining. So wanting to understand more um, about potential differences in the, in the interest and use of digital interventions across U.S. populations, and this is for tobacco use, we analyzed data from five state quit lines that offered counseling and off, also offered a web-only intervention option. So in this analysis, which as you can see included, included Kansas, um, it included almost 33,000 enrollees. So you know that quit line services can be sought in more than one way. You can call 1-800-QUIT-NOW, and you can also access quit lines via the web. And then you can choose whether you prefer telephone counseling or to follow the web-only program for those who have that option. And these are adjusted analyses for whether enrollees entered in the quit line via the website, and then whether they um, you know, enrolled in the web-only program or chose the counseling program. And we saw the same pattern for both web entry and enrollment in services. So Asian Americans, Latinos, and white adults were significantly more likely to initiate sign up online and enroll in the web only program, while African Americans were least likely to enter the quit line via the internet or to select the online only program. And then 
Even further, among those who enrolled in the web-only service, engagement, as indicated by sort of the number of times a person logged into the website, was significantly lower among African-Americans. And this was independent of education, income, age, and sex. So it's sort of, you know, I wasn't really surprised by the findings, but it suggests that we have to really think about the potential for widening disparities as we go down these, this path. But, you know, I, I think that that's important because we want tobacco interventions to be for the benefit of all populations. And this move toward digitization of interventions, we need to think about this with an equity lens. So we went back then, we returned to the need, we strategized on approaches to be responsive using population-based approaches while maintaining community competence. And our question became, is it possible to improve the cessation rates and engagement of African-Americans in the context of a state quit line? So we move next to the discussion here of effectiveness research um, and initial dis dissemination. Okay, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about a, a randomized control trial that I completed just before, so just a year ago before joining NIH, and it's called Project Free, and it tested the effectiveness of a culturally specific intervention as a component of quitline care. So we developed a video-based tobacco cessation intervention targeting African-American adults, which was a translation of an efficacious, culturally specific group CBT that I described earlier. And it was also an update to the well-known and widely disseminated smoking cessation guide. Um, the intervention is called, this one is called Pathways to Freedom, um, leading the way to a smoke-free community. When we developed this video, it was intended to be delivered in multiple formats, given the changing technology, but we also wanted to provide much of the same content delivered in our face-to-face -face intervention. And then we also formatted this video intervention in such a way that we can increase reach, hopefully. And I will say that this intervention is nationally disseminated now by the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network. Um, actually, they have a new name now because even they've expanded. And it's also been used now for years in trainings and also for individual use. And shortly, I'm really excited that this intervention will be distributed in, through 19 state quit lines, which is very exciting. And it's the goal of interventionists who wanna make sure that our interventions don't sit on a shelf. But you have to have the evidence before we're getting to that point, right? And though this is just an overview of the sections of the full Pathways to Freedom video intervention, and we were careful to integrate culturally specific components throughout. And this included things like attention to the content, the colors, the music, the images. A couple of examples, this Pathways to Freedom video-based intervention focuses on the history of African-Americans in the tobacco industry. Uh, we included stories from participants who had successfully quit in our face-to-face -face intervention. And we discussed culturally relevant coping skills. And, and we were very careful here to apply an overall asset-based approach um, and a resilience approach to becoming tobacco-free. I mean, one of my criticisms of health disparities research is it, in many cases, kind of applies as a deficit model, which we need to sort of move away from. So participants were identified. They self-identified as African-American. They were enrolled in the North Carolina State Quitline, which is operated by Optum. We randomized 1,053 participants to one of three conditions. So this is the largest smoking cessation intervention trial focused on African-Americans, behavioral trials. And I was delighted that we were able to reach our recruitment target significantly ahead of schedule. And we had a very low rate of declined participation, only about 4%. And the first condition was usual care provided by the quit line, which consisted of up to four coaching calls, plus standard self-help materials and nicotine replacement therapy. The second was standard quit line services, plus a standard smoking cessation video. And then the third condition was the Pathways to Freedom condition or the PTF condition, which added this PTF video. Participants in the two video conditions also had the opportunity, well, they had the opportunity to view this intervention as either a DVD or uh, you know, keeping it old school or a private YouTube channel. And the quit coaches were trained through the quit line to refer to relevant sections of each video um, during the counseling calls as appropriate. And we also followed these participants um, at three and six month post-randomization. 
we had really high retention, which was amazing for a quitline context. We had about 80% retention at three months, 75 at six months, which is not a small feat in a quitline context. So I'll show you some of our initial results. Um, so these are select baseline demographics to characterize the sample. Almost half were married. They were about 48 years old. 70% were female. Um, and that was consistent throughout the, the trial that we kind of stated 70% female. Most uh, of these participants completed at least high school and um, or more. And 36% reported an annual income of less than $25,000. One of the questions we sought to answer was whether the culturally specific emphasis would affect intervention engagement. And we have a few indicators of this that we'll analyze shortly, but here's one metric of engagement. This is the YouTube channel for the control video, which is the how to quit intervention. So viewers could opt to watch the full 60 minute intervention or they could choose segments covering various topics. We also sent um, text messages bi-weekly including links to the segmented videos in both of the two video conditions. And in the standard group, we sent them motivational messages as a attention control. One of the questions um, also, oh, this is the uh, Pathways to Freedom YouTube channel. So you can get a sense looking at it of the difference in sort of the look and feel right away in terms of the, so the surface structure. And again, they could watch the entire video, which they're both about 60 minutes, or they could watch segmented um, segmented components. And what we observed was that the Pathways to Freedom video generated a 70%, 76% increase in website engagement relative to how to quit. And this pattern was observed for each of the video segments as well. So that bolsters confidence that this effect is real. And this figure um, is the initial, are the initial, initial bivariate analyses of abstinent by condition. As you can see, Pathways to Freedom led to significantly greater abstinence at the six month time point, both the seven day point prevalence abstinence and 30 day abstinence. And this is our primary um, time point compared to the other two conditions. And the differences at the three month time point were not statistically significant in terms of the difference. So we have continued this research by translating the Pathways to Freedom intervention into a mobile health format um, and we recently completed a two-arm pilot RCT, which will be published soon in Psychology of Addictive Behavior. So I'll keep this brief, but I wanted to just share a little bit about this mHealth project. I know some of um, the investigators at Kansas are interested in, in mHealth research. And so we mirrored this mHealth program on NCI, Smoke Free Text Program. And we recently published a study actually showing that African-Americans are less likely to quit using smoke free text compared with white individuals. So we segmented our Pathways to Freedom intervention further. These were 30 to 120 second chunks of content, which were pushed out over six weeks to participants. They also had on-demand access to pull messages anytime using three keywords. I should mention that we also conducted a formative process to do this before finalizing the mHealth program, which is called Path to Quit. And here's what we found. We specifically recruited a low income sample here. So 50% of these participants were residents of federally subsidized housing. And participants were randomized to receive smoke-free text or PAC to quit. And then we followed up with them at the end of the intervention in the, just this pilot study. They also received their choice of a nicotine replacement therapy starter supply, which is 14 days of nicotine gum or patches. And we found that both interventions were highly rated in terms of quality, content, and acceptability with no significant difference. We also asked about the use of the programs and found that use was, I'd say, moderate to strong. It sort of tailed off over time, which I think is common um, with internet-based um, and mobile health interventions. And there was no significant difference there. However, there were significant differences on behavioral indicators, these kind of antecedents to behavior change, so we found greater days of NRT use in the path to quit condition and also lower urges to smoke at follow-up compared to smoke-free text. As this was a pilot study, we mostly focused on feasibility and acceptability. However, we, we did assess smoking-related behavior changes and adjusting for age, since this was you know, different between our conditions at baseline, this was a motivated sample, right? And almost all of the participants reported attempted, attempting to quit 
for at least 24 hours. The difference in seven day point prevalence abstinence was not statistically significant. However, abstinence rates were greater in the um, path to quit versus the smoke-free text intervention. And we did find that the odds of having carbon monoxide verified abstinence was 3.6 times greater in the path to quit versus the smoke-free text group, um, which is a significant difference. So I think there's so much to unpack from everything that I've described in these studies. So I'll offer a few kind of overarching conclusions. I think we need to spend more time and effort to focus on interventions that can actually reduce and eliminate health disparities. The documentation is the first step, but we do need to continue moving forward. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. Group interventions, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy for smoking cessation, which we know CBT is, is our gold standard for many um, mental health, psychological, addictive behaviors. It shows significant potential in this regard. And many people I think would say or endorse that there, we know that it's important to have culturally specific messages and interventions, yet there's surprisingly little confirmatory evidence for this. And I think it's in part because it's often difficult to show those incremental effects over and above standard you know, evidence-based approaches. And our work for the past decade has helped contribute to this evidence in the realm of tobacco cessation with methods that can be applied to other health behaviors and, and addictive behaviors. It also shows that we can translate effective face-to-face -face intensive interventions into population-based interventions. So I wanna also say a little bit more about what we, I think where, where the field of health disparities and minority health need to go to advance. We study health disparities because the significant scientific and the treatment advances that have been made have not benefited all populations. This is a wicked problem and it's staring at all of us. And it is beyond time that we make this, you know, acceleration of meaningful, measurable progress and move into third and fourth generation health disparity science. And I think of first generation health disparities research as this initial step, as I've mentioned, of sort of the documentation of health disparities, their prevalence, et cetera. Second generation health disparities research is the study of the contributing factors and the mechanisms that underlie risk. And we've seen a fair amount of work in that area as well. Now, third generation health disparities research is developing and testing these interventions that reduce and ultimately the goal is elimination. And then the fourth generation of health disparities research involves population level in intervention implementation. It involves uptake and the application of a true health equity lens from the start of our efforts all the way through their sustained completion. And from where I sit, that's where I think we need to go from here. So these projects um, had lots of great collaborators on this work who I'm very appreciative of. Um, most importantly, I'm appreciative for our participants. Otherwise this work wouldn't be possible in our community navigator who's essential to help us engage communities. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you have questions for Dr. Webb Hooper, you can put them in the uh, chat window or as a direct message to me. Um, I have a question I'd like to start with and then we'll go to Dr. Steve Sussman after that for his question. Um, my question concerns um, some of the alternatives to traditional combustible cigarettes. So are you seeing the same health disparities in terms of um, use of e-cigarettes, for example, or other, other forms of uh, non-combustible cigarettes? It's a great question. And um, the literature thus far, so let's use e-cigarettes um, as, as an example, um, a very common example, I think of, of you know, lots of interest in e-cigarettes. We see um, that the prevalence of e-cigarette use tends to be highest among white ind individuals. That's true for both adolescents and also for adults. Um, and so there haven't been many studies who have examined this from a health disparities perspective. Um, there are indications that African-American adults are interested in using e-cigarettes as a cessation aid and that there are racial ethnic differences there. And actually our group published one of the first studies to look at racial ethnic differences in e-cigarette use intentions and reasons for use. And that's what we found. Um, and so the concern that I have and expressed in that study is that if 
um, if it replicates, it was a convenient sample. So if it replicates in larger samples that, that racial ethnic minorities, and in, in this case, African-Americans are interested in using e-cigarettes to quit, but if e-cigarettes aren't helpful with that or may lead to dual use, then we do have the potential to widen the duration of exposure and thus widen health disparities or at least not be able to eliminate them. So I think that there, that's an area that we need more work um, to really understand how this, this impacts. Um, and then we also know that racial ethnic minorities, African-Americans, as an example, are greater, uh, have a greater propensity to use, well, I shouldn't say propensity, but are more likely to use for, for non-individual reasons, um, multiple tobacco products. So maybe smoking cigarettes, maybe using little cigars or cigarillos, and also maybe smoking marijuana as well. And so that's another concern. And what I found in, in the research that I've conducted directly um, are that my participants, and I think it's true in general, but certainly as it relates to our mostly lower income African-American adults who've come in who wish to quit smoking, um, the continuation of use of other tobacco products is, um, it makes it extremely difficult to quit. It's almost a non-starter. I actually could run an analysis to see, you know, and I haven't done this, but it'd be interesting to see for those people who report multiple tobacco product use, what is the difference in their outcomes compared to those who um, started the intervention and if only have a history of sort of single uh, product use, and that would be of combustible cigarettes in this case. So that's probably a long answer to the question, but um, that's, I think there's more to be done to understand this better. It's helpful, thank you. Um, so we'll go to Steve Sussman next, and then after that will be Richie. Um, uh, hi folks, uh, hi Monica. Um, well, I, I um, well, I've, uh, okay, well, I've never been a, afraid to humiliate myself. So I'll, I'll ask a, a, a question out of, uh, probably out of, of na naivety. I, I know you, you, you had one, one slide really quick talking about uh, specific messaging maybe for, in, in terms of a CBT being culturally sensitive uh, m messaging or not. I'm picking up importance of themes of empowerment, identification, and access. And, and those seem to be kind of underlying characteristics of, of, of cessation programming that would work for uh, African-American population. Are there specific messaging features that would operate? And I, I asked that one because there's always a risk of, of stereotyping, you know, trying to say, oh, well, you know, with this group, you give that message. So I'm wondering if it's not so much the kinds of messages that are offered, but more representation and access. That's a great question. And it, it's not one to be humiliated about a lot. It's a, it's a good question. I think it's both. I don't think it's just access because um, treatments tend to be underutilized um, by racial ethnic minorities. And we know that's true for psychotherapy in general. It's true for addictions treatment as well. And I think that it's complex in terms of the reasons why, but I think one reason is because there is a lack of sort of cultural responsivity, if you will, within those interventions. So taking the standard interventions, the standard messages and thinking that if we just provide greater access and we move these interventions as an example into um, a, a federally qualified health center that might be serving you know, medically underserved populations and that, that would do it. What I found is that it's actually true to some degree. I mean, we, we did publish a study showing that our standard CBT that's you know part of the tobacco clinical practice guidelines is beneficial among Latinos adults and among African-American adults as well, with no difference really um, com when you compare them to um, white adult smokers or people who smoke. Um, so it is, it is the case that it generalizes, but we actually have even greater effects which is important and hard to find if you are more intentional about the messages being culturally specific. And I, I use the example here of racial discrimination, which is positively associated with tobacco use among African-Americans. And it is a topic you would not touch in a standard intervention. But when we discuss it in our culturally specific intervention, the, the conversation is very rich to say the least. Um, it does have to be handled with sensitivity and care and has to have a facilitator or therapist who can manage that discussion and knowing because that could go into all kinds of ways. Um, but if done effectively, and there's an art to this as well, I think the, the difference in messages is important. 
Um, so it's access, it's messaging, it's representation. Um, and it's sort of applying that lens to understand the unique characteristics of groups. Um, also, I do take your point about stereotyping. And that's one of my concerns is that we don't want to do that. And, and there, we don't want to um, ignore that there's so much within group heterogeneity. And we've found that. We've found that um, in some other projects that the people who are most receptive to culturally specific interventions are those who are more traditional in their racial or ethnic kind of orientation, um, if you will, and in their beliefs and practices. So that everyone should have a choice, I think, of which intervention that they might be interested in receiving versus assuming that because one is identified as belonging to a certain population, that this is the intervention they must receive. I think there's a danger in doing that. That has to be considered. So it's a good question. Wonderful. OK. Um, we're actually going to switch the order a little bit here. Um, sorry, Rich, but we have a question from one of our trainees that I'd like to give them an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, so Fernanda, you asked an interesting question about COVID. Would you like to share that? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was wonderful. I'm learning a lot. And uh, so your presentation highlighted the importance of developing culturally specific interventions on tobacco use. And uh, currently we have COVID and we want to be effective on uh, disseminating the message to make people engage in safe behaviors, uh, for example, mask wearing or vaccines. So based on your experience with culturally specific interventions, what are some aspects of these interventions uh, with tobacco that can also be effective to promote healthy behaviors for COVID? Thank you very much, Fernanda, for the question. So, um, and, I, and I'll back this up to say that NIH is uh, currently supporting um, large initiatives to focus on exactly the questions that you're asking. We have two initiatives in particular. One is our rapid acceleration of diagnostics, um, underserved populations, which you may be all familiar with. And then there's also another initiative that we call SEAL, which is Community Engagement Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. And in both of these um, initiatives, one of the, the, um, the goals is to work within communities to develop messages that would be appropriate to address factors such as not only education, but addressing distrust, uh, combating disinformation, which is sort of the deliberate spread of misinformation, and how to work with communities to figure out what the best messages for them would be. Um, especially because if we're talking about um, maybe a, a multi-generational family where there are, you know, there, there may be a grandmother in the home, but there are family members who uh, work outside of the house, how do we help um, these families manage the behavioral mitigation that we'd like them to see in a situation where it's kind of impossible, impossible to socially distance and not, you know, create some and create some exposure within the family. So I think that the same kinds of approaches and models can be applied to how we look at COVID and other public health behaviors. But I think it starts with the foundation of, of understanding what the community members want and what's best for them versus us sort of deciding. Okay, we're going to go with uh, Brianna next, and then we'll go to Christina after that. Great. So I find this topic super interesting. A lot of my work focuses on tailoring CBT interventions for LGBTQ folks, um, and something I'm trying to make sense of tying actually into the stereotyping discussion before um, is if you have any sense of if folks who think tailored interventions will be more effective, um, benefit more than the folks who are skeptical. Um, and I guess sort of related to that, I'm wondering, did the folks in your trials know that they were signing up specifically for an intervention tailored to African-Americans? Thank you, Brianna, for the question. So um, depends on the study, what, what we told them in advance. Um, but, and you know, we did publish a study way back in 2000, eight, I think, looking at, um, and it wasn't a culturally specific intervention, but just looking at expectancies for tailored interventions in general. Um, and we looked at, um, we, we kind of developed at the time what we call the placebo tailored intervention. And we delivered that to smokers. And in some cases we told them, this is cultural, this is tailored, not culturally, but this is individually tailored for you based on what you've shared with us about yourself. And then 
Um, and it wasn't, it was just personalized. It was very surface structure kind of changes to understand if that, um, how people respond to thinking that something might be tailored for them versus if it actually, we went through the effort to do that. And what we found was that there was sort of a placebo effect, just telling people that this is something that was tailored for, for them actually led to better outcomes. Um, we do have a measure that we have that we have those data to look at the same kind of expectancies related construct for culturally uh, tailored, culturally specific interventions. I just haven't analyzed it to find out. And I haven't noticed anyone else who has looked at that. Um, but it is, it's, so it's an empirical question about, about that piece. But in some of the studies we did tell them, in some studies they were blind to which intervention they, they received. But I think um, for our face-to-face -face interventions, it was quite clear um, when we had an intervention that was designed in case, it, for example, among African-Americans, because there were only other African-Americans around um, and, and in the study. So we didn't, that was not at all a secret in that case, but they didn't, they were blind to what condition they were receiving. Great, so we will go to Christina next and then uh, Lisa Sanderson-Cox after that. So Christina, you should be able to unmute and ask your question. It's like we might be having a little bit of difficulty there. Let's go ahead and we'll come back. Now let's go to uh, Lisa Sanderson-Cox with a question. Hi, Monica. We're so glad to have you here. Um, okay, this is a big question. So this may not have an answer, but I'm curious about your thoughts. Um, we know that we have these big risk factors when we're talking about individual success and quitting. We know that there are these big risk factors that are related to continued use that are more social systemic factors like wealth or neighborhood factors or discrimination or acculturation stress. So in thinking about culturally specific interventions applied to an individual, whether it's counseling or text-based interventions, we're focusing on individual skill building to address some of the individual risk factors like stress management, for instance. Um, that I can understand, but I don't know what we do when we find out about these, you know, really big risk factors. How can individual interventions address something like um, acculturation stress or discrimination when we're working with just a single individual? Does that make sense? It does. It does make sense. Um, and so I think I have two parts to my, my answer on that because I actually have thought about it. It's a big question and, and, and I haven't seen it done well. Um, but I think, you know, as a psychologist, I'm mostly operating at individual level in terms of the interventions. And I think things like acculturative stress, experiences of discrimination, living where you live, um, although these are societal problems, it's what people are dealing with and it's what they have to deal with. And even as we work to change policies and to address things like structural racism. These are long lofty goals that are part, as I mentioned, of a very wicked problem. And so it is important that, um, that individuals manage to cope with the reality of what is happening in the United States. And that would apply, I think, to any socially disadvantaged group. Um, and so, because it's a burden that is carried and is going to be there for the force, probably for their lifetime. And so while we talk about that, but we, but we have explicit conversations about that. And that's, I think, one of the features of a culturally specific intervention that, that makes it efficacious compared to a standard one where you would not discuss those topics. We would teach them about cognitive reframing and problem solving and relaxation training, but we wouldn't talk about any of the realities of their lives and the social condition. And when you do that, you open up the door for people to engage, I think, in a deeper level of sort of metacognitive processing that allows them to better cope and manage with those situations. Um, so I think that that's, that's the approach that we've taken. The other thing that I think we should have more science um, focused on are multi-level intervention. So not only approaching at the community level, I mean, at the individual level, but at the community level, at the interpersonal level. So there are ways that you can still have as a foundation, perhaps an individual level intervention, but add in 
partnerships and other methodologies that are at the up, that, that incorporate the upstream determinants. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, that's that's really helpful. Okay, so I um, conveniently have Christina's question in the chat, so I can just read it aloud. Um, she's asking, has this work been looked at among American Indian or Alaska Native populations? Yeah, so I, um, it's, it's a good question and not enough, but the answer is yes. Um, and I would think that, so we've seen these kinds of studies among Latinos, Hispanics, among American Indian, Alaska Natives, and among individuals who are sexual and gender minorities, where people have attempted to develop culturally specific interventions, again, using one of a few names to describe it. Um, and we find that the evidence is generally equivocal. And that's why I think that although people think sort of in theory, yeah, that makes sense, we should, we should do that. But when you, when you delve into the literature and you're looking for evidence to say that the, that the focus on cultural factors um, makes a difference, it's harder to find those studies. And, and, and then the other, and, and especially th those studies that are done in a well-controlled design where you can actually make a causal conclusion uh, without having some major um, you know, confounding variable that might explain it all. And that I think is one reason that we haven't seen that work advance and be disseminated because we, there's so much criticism of the available of the, the literature there. Um, and I recently looked at a similar, similar question um, for an NCI monograph I'm working on. And in the chapter that we're working on, we look at you know, these interventions um, and even um, in an upcoming Surgeon General's report, which will be focused on tobacco disparities. And we looked at this among sexual and gender minorities. And there's so many problems. Um, lumping LGBT in one study, not looking at the distinctions across populations. Um, and then the studies that are very small, one arm designs or other things that, that I think allow people to sort of uh, throw daggers, if you will, at the, at the science um, of it. So we need more, but it, and it could be in part because maybe in the pilot phase, we're not seeing enough support to justify a larger scale randomized trial, which doesn't mean this isn't important, but it might mean that we need to go back to the methods that we use to develop these. And there are not many studies that really describe methodology. Everyone approaches this and, and does this, conducts these interventions, develops and conducts them in a very different way. Wonderful. The next question is gonna be from Jerry Schultz. Hi, um, you know, I, I work uh, with much more with the upper levels of the socioecological model. So really interested in these community and social societal level interventions, but also multi-level interventions. So you, know, you mentioned uh, the need to move away from the deficit model, but I'm kind of curious what you think the, the, the strengths and the assets and the facilitators within the minoritized communities you've worked with bring to um, this, this field or this work, these studies? Okay, so yeah, good question. I think that at the point that, I'm, that I was making in that statement was that typically in health disparities research, the focus has been on, you know, what's wrong with the community, the barriers that are there, they may be low income or under-resourced. And, and so much of it kind of at times has come across like we just need to fix the community and just get them on board. Why can't they just, you know, do these things the way everybody else does? Them? And, and I'm being a little bit facetious, but, but that's kind of the underlying tone to a lot of the work that you see. And I think that it's important that we recognize that all communities, whether we define them geographically or we describe them by an affiliation um, or an identification or an attrib attributed identification with a certain population, that there are always assets that can be brought to bear and brought to the table. And the work that I've done, you know, working very closely with community partners, um, you know, and in, and in the case of African-Americans, there's, there's such a, a strength and resilience um, within the community because of the many challenges that we face yet still have reached heights that we've reached. And so when you can kind of connect people to the fact that they, they do have strengths, even though they may be seeing nothing but negative statistics about their group and many different sectors, you can bring them along and, and they know the strength that they have. I think many times researchers don't think about it that way, but the groups know what strengths they have. 
And we need to bring them into this process earlier. And then I think the assets and, and what the groups bring to the table will become much more apparent. That makes sense. Wonderful. Um, so I'm afraid we're, we're out of time for questions, um, but I, I want to just wrap up by saying on behalf of the Kaufman Logan Center leadership team, I want to thank you, Dr. Webb Cooper, for taking the time today. I'm sure as a deputy director at an NIH institute, you have a very busy schedule. Um, and certainly the work you're doing is uh, very urgent and very needed. So thank you for joining us today. Um, it was a wonderful presentation and the answers to, your, to the questions were, were great as well. So thank you. Um, I want to remind everyone of our first Coffin Logan Center training workshop, which is happening next week with Justin, uh, Dr. Justin Strickland of Johns Hopkins will be talking about using crowdsourcing for addictions research, sort of the strengths and the pitfalls and, and best practices for doing that as we try and keep our research going in the middle of a pandemic. You know, crowdsourcing is one way we can do that, but there are some important challenges to consider. Um, and then also check our website and Twitter for more information on upcoming brown bag and seminar talks. Uh, we have a great start with Dr. Webb Hooper's presentation today, but we have two other internationally renowned experts coming later in the semester. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you to Dr. Webb Hooper for an outstanding presentation this morning. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for having me.